Good morning. Good morning. I'm excited to be here. I hope you are. And I know that you've come with the anticipation of meeting with the Lord. So we're here to do that. Our theme today is about the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have Eddie Chumney with us in the house, and he spent uh, most of this week with us and trying to teach me and bring me up to, to par. And he's going to share his second uh, message with you today about what he's learned over the past year studying the Dead Sea Scrolls, some fascinating information that I'll be continuing later on as we talk about it. So Dead Sea Scrolls is our theme today. That's hearing God and knowing what God's doing. But let me say, Shabbat Shalom. I, I am delighted to be here. I have been waiting for some time for this day for us to be able to worship together. Uh, we come together as a congregation every time that we come for worship. We come and remind ourselves that there's only one God and that we are commanded to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So if you'll join me, we're going to recite together the Shema Israel, And you, uh, we're going to recite uh, this year. We change translations every year. This year, the English part is in the New King James Version. So let's recite together as we call ourselves into worship, blow the shofar, and begin presenting ourselves to the Lord. As Paul has told us in Romans 12, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing unto me. Let's recite the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words, which I command you today, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And in Hebrew, it sounds something like this. Shema Israel, Yehovah Eloheinu, Yehovah Echad, Ve'afta et, Yehovah Elohaika, Ve'kol Levavika, Uve'kol Nafshika, Uve'kol Meodeka. Let's blow the shofar. We've got a line, and it's going to be a little loud if you're not used to the shofars. But join with us now as we present ourselves in worship to the Lord. Let's hear the shofars. Hallelujah. Welcome. What an awesome crowd. Thank you for coming out today. Let's step one foot closer to the Lord, shall we? Thank you. 
thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing is for you he's for you he's for It's all I 
thank you today. Keep Jeremy and his family in your prayers today as he travels. You guys sound great today. Give yourselves a hand. You guys sound great. Be. Mm-hmm. 
God, sing with me how great our God, and I will see how great, how great He is, how much Thank you for your worship today. You may be seated. Wow. Come on in and find you a seat, those that are around. Uh, what a blessed day. I'm not sure what I do, John. Just exit out? No. Nope. I am thrilled to be here. I have been waiting for some time. Um, many of you, well, many of you were here Wednesday and you heard me tell uh, the story of, uh, what, 2000 and what was it when Eddie and I met? I can't remember, years ago. Okay. Um, what a blessing he's been in my life and in the life of our congregation. Um, I was wowed at the very beginning of his ability to know the scripture, quote the scripture, find the scripture quickly. That's amazing. Uh, the intellect and the, the ability to be able to do that and the memory that he has. But I told him last night, I said, that the thing that really amazes me is that he can put the dots together. Uh, he does that better than any person I've ever known personally. Uh, he can take a theme. Now, he's an old computer programmer, and I said that probably has something to do with it, the language and how it ties together and the strings that are there. And I don't know much about computer programming, but he agreed with me, so I thought that was good. He can, he can take a theme or a question, and he can put, 10 or 12 verses scattered all through the scripture and tie them together. And at first you think, how does that verse fit with this? And then when he gets through, you're like, oh, I never saw it that way. Amazing ability. He has spent many, many years studying and, and digging into the Bible and has been one of the leaders in the Hebraic roots uh, beginnings and all the way through. What a, what a blessing to our nation, to the world. He travels the world and speaks. And what a blessing for us for him to be here. And I know that you want to be a part of his ministry. And you, can, uh, you can't go with him or you can't keep him here, but you can send your money with him. So uh, today, uh, sometime, give him uh, a part of your uh, proceeds of part of what you have and just write a check and give it to him or take cash and give it to him if you want to go through uh, the coffers of our church you can you can give it here and designate it to him and we'll get it to him but we want to bless him as he has blessed us now I've had the privilege uh, through the years of spending lots of time with Eddie he used to come and stay in our home and we'd visit for several days and we were distracted by a few other things, but generally, Eddie is very focused and just right on track of what he wants me to learn. And this week, I have become the student, and he has become the professor, and he's spent lots of hours pouring into me. I'm hoping that in the future, I can pass a part of that at least on to you. That's his intent. I'm excited that he's here to share with you today. He's going to reveal to you uh, something that I had never seen before in the scripture. And I think you'll find it fascinating. He has spent uh, approximately a year concentrating on the Dead Sea Scrolls. I've been intrigued by the Dead Sea Scrolls, but I've never spent the time to look at them and study them. And, and he's studied the Dead Sea Scrolls and he's read nearly every book that any author has written about the Dead Sea Scrolls, and he's combined all that information. And it's 
amazing. You know, in 1947, when they began to discover the scrolls in, in Israel, in the Qumran, and we began to hear about the Dead Sea Scrolls, we're just now getting the benefits from that. Uh, they found over 900 scrolls. And the, the wealth of information that's there is changing the way we see Christianity. And it's an, it's an amazing, amazing study. And Eddie has uh, narrowed this down to some important parts that he thinks we, as the remnant, need to know. So pay close attention today as you listen to him. And then in the future, we'll be studying and we'll have him back to clarify the things that I mess up in, in passing on to you. So I'm excited that Eddie's here. Give him a round of applause of, of Texas. And, and Eddie, come and share with us. Is my okay, good. <clears throat> my mic's on. Um, thank you very much, Pastor and wife Brenda, and the congregation here for welcoming me and allowing me to spend um, time with you. So I want to begin by saying Shabbat Shalom, y'all. But I also um, want to thank Yeshua the Messiah for giving me the privilege, joy, and honor to be able to be with you and to share with you uh, some of the things I've been studying and what I believe that Yeshua wants me to share with you. So um, I believe in the sovereignty of God. And I believe he leads, guides, and directs my life and your life. And so um, because of his sovereignty and his will, I'm here. And so I want to first thank Yeshua for that. So uh, today what I want to share with you is information that I've gleaned and learned by studying the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I started this winter to do a comprehensive study of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I realized that there are component parts of information that we can glean and learn from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So on Wednesday, I shared one of those teachings, uh, which is um, the restoring of the Zadok priesthood. And so you've probably never heard of that before. And so uh, this is why, um, from the information, the Dead Sea Scrolls, I wanted to share that information on Wednesday night. So I believe it was recorded. So if you wasn't able to be there, maybe perhaps um, you can watch um, the videotape of that. But today, I want to share with you a message that I've entitled, Why Was Yeshua Called a Nazarene? And the title of the message comes from the verse in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 23, where it says, He came and lived in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken through the prophets that he will be called a Nazarene. Now, there is no explicit verse in the prophets that says the Messiah will be called a Nazarene. But if you understand Hebraically um, the scriptures, we have the literal, but we also have in the scriptures things that are hinted or alluded to, or some things that are even hidden in the Hebrew. So um, it is there, but I'm here to share with you how, in this case, it might be so. And so in order to really be able to put the pieces together, you have to know the background and the history surrounding the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, in the last uh, 20 or 25 years, um, in proclaiming the message that in expressing our faith in Yeshua as the Messiah, we can understand our better more our Bible more comprehensively if we understand it Hebraically through the culture and time in which it was written. And so 
in order to teach that, we've had to explain a little bit of history on the Christian side of things. Explain that basically from the time of Constantine, which is around the year 321, that the Christianity that we've inherited and we see around us is really a Greco-Roman Christianity. So that needed to be explained and, and how that has kept us in certain areas and things to understand our Bible more comprehensively. But what we haven't got as well an understanding on that will help us understand Yeshua, help us understand the early believers in, in Yeshua, help us to understand the book of Acts and the New Testament in general, is we need to understand biblical Jewish history. And so in order to help in that process, that is why I shared the message on Wednesday night that that biblical Jewish history entails understanding the high priesthood of Israel and follow that through. And where that road goes is through the Qumran. It goes through the Dead Sea Scrolls. And early faith in Messiah, soon after um, he was crucified and resurrected, the understanding of the early faith and the influence of it as well goes through the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Qumran. And so there are three main historians of the period where we can glean information. The second century B.C., the first century B.C., uh, and in the days of Yeshua. And those historians are Josephus, Philo, and Pliny the Elder. And all three of those historians refer to the people that lived in the Qumran area as being Essenes. And the word Essene is believed to um, mean pious or holy. So now if you begin to think regarding what the historians say were the three main sects in Judaism of the time, we have the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. And so the Essene community at least in the Qumran, was initially formed around the year 175 B.C. And from those days until the days of Yeshua, we have approximately 200 years. So they didn't know Yeshua, the person that was walking on the earth, as being the Messiah before he came. And so... Their community, the Essenes, actually their community lived throughout the land of Israel, not just in the Dead Sea area, not just in the Qumran, that because of their, you might say, doctrinal beliefs and their expectations regarding the Messiah, which I hope to be able uh, to go over with you and, and, and cover um, what I desire uh, to be able to show you that because of their expectations of the Messiah, it enabled them to believe in Yeshua as the Messiah because their belief system and expectation was so close. However, the Pharisees, their doctrines, their expectations, um, it caused them, and, and what they focused on uh, in their belief system, it caused them to not believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. So actually, uh, given the fact that the Sadducees were associated with the temple, and the temple got destroyed in 70 AD, so basically um, they don't have any job to do, that particular sect. What was left is the Essenes and the Pharisees. And you might say these are... Um, two houses of the Jewish side of the family. And so ultimately, um, the Essenes, many and most of them, 
believed that Yeshua was the Messiah, and they influenced um, the belief in Yeshua in the first century, and many of the doctrines that today that you would associate and identify with Christianity um, was the belief system of the Essenes. So ultimately, they merged into the early faith in Yeshua as the Messiah. And then as the faith went out into the non-Jewish world, um, they dropped the emphasis of what was regarded as those things that were Jewish. And in order to appeal more broader to the non-Jewish world, um, the faith became um, more Greco-Roman looking and Greco-Roman like. Meanwhile, the other branch, the Pharisees, it was from the Pharisaic sect that ended up writing the Talmud. Uh, and and the, the predominant Talmud is the Babylonian Talmud. And today, they are not called Pharisees. Uh, those that uh, study and um, identify with the Talmud, today they're called Orthodox Jews or Orthodox Judaism. And so, um, on the Jewish side of things, things branched into those that believe that Yeshua is the Messiah and those that didn't. Now, 100% of all the Essenes didn't believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. However, there was a significant number that as soon as they started to believe in Yeshua as the Messiah, what label or what name would people observing them, what name would they give them? Well, they've been known um, by the historians, at least, as the Essenes for 150, 200 years. And so now they're expecting a Messiah to come. And now when Yeshua is teaching and doing his ministry, um, when he dies on the cross, when he dies on the tree, um, they end up seeing that he is the Messiah and so what was the very initial name and label they gave to the sect of the Essenes that believed that Yeshua is the Messiah? Well, they were regarded as a branch of the Essenes. Today we would say a sect, or today we would say a denomination. Um, but they were regarded as a branch of the Essenes that believed in Yeshua as the Messiah. So the Hebrew word for branch is, or at least one of the words, is netzar. And from the Hebrew word netzar, we have netzarin. Nazarene is how we would say it in English. So one way to really look at this word Nazarene back into the Hebrew, you can uh, really render it. Uh, that the fulfillment of the prophecy is that he would be called a branch. Well, um, most commonly when we read in the verses of the Bible, Nazarene, we almost exclusively think of it as uh, the town that Yeshua grew up in. He grew up in Nazareth. Um, However, uh, this author of the book um, that I looked at, and I'm, I'm displaying the book here where some of this information comes from regarding taking the word Nazarene into the Greek and breaking it down and examining the scriptures. The book uh, is called Yeshua, He Will Be Called a Nazarene. And one of the main points uh, that this book wanted to make um, is that not every place where we have the occurrence of the word Nazarene in the New Testament should it be identified with the town of Nazareth. Now, of course, there are verses where it should be identified with the town of Nazareth, but not all verses. So in those other verses, 
How should we understand the meaning of the word? Well, the way that we should understand the meaning of the word is it is referring to identifying Yeshua with the, the Essene sect, those group of Jews that believed that Yeshua is the Messiah, given that the name is connected to the Hebrew word for branch. And so in Acts chapter 24 and verse 5, uh, Paul, in offering his defense of his faith before the Roman governor Felix, um, Paul's accuser, Tertullius, describes Paul as a leader of the sect of the Nazarenes. And so the occurrence there of that verse is not referring to the town of Nazareth, but um, to those who come from the Qumran, the Essenes, here called a sect, that Paul is being identified with the sect of the Nazarenes. And thus, the prophecy in Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, Yeshua is being identified with um, the Essenes that believe that he is the Messiah. Now, Yeshua did not belong to any specific sect. Yeshua was not a Sadducee. Yeshua was not a Pharisee. Yeshua was not an Essene. Um, when they inquired of him in the book of John, Yeshua said, well, my doctrine comes from my father. And so um, he belongs to the sect of his father. Okay, but now, um, you know how um, when we're dialoguing with other people, with other believers, we want to label them. Um, we want to label them to a denomination that where they might attend in expressing their faith. And so we have all kinds of labels, denominations, uh, by which uh, we can specifically label someone further refining uh, regarding that they would generally be seen and generally be called as a Christian. So, when they looked at what Yeshua taught, when they looked at what, what Yeshua did, and then they looked at the belief system of the Essenes and the belief system of the Pharisees, those out observing, and they want to give a label to those that are believing in Yeshua as the Messiah, the label that they're going to give is um, he's being identified with the Qumran community. He's being identified with the Essenes. And they didn't have a name for it. So he's just a branch of those um, that believe that he is the Messiah. So that's the basic point um, of the first part of this message from the information um, in this book um, where he went into quite technical detail uh, breaking down the Greek. So um, rather than um, taking um, all the verses and showing you uh, the Greek and reading how he breaks down the Greek, I wanted to verbalize it for you, you know, in plain English. However, there is a reference that the Messiah is um, likened to a branch from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, where it says, A shoot will come out of the stock of Jesse, and a branch out of his roots will bear fruit. So this is specifically talking about um, the lineage of Jesse, that a descendant, um, a branch will come out of um, his roots, but we could take the concept that Messiah is prophesied uh, to be a branch that grows out of a stump of a tree 
And that's where we can view that the scripture is giving um, a hint to who the Messiah may be. It's here in, in this case, it's in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is one of the prophets. And so this is another way by which uh, perhaps the meaning is meant by the prophecy uh, that he will be called a Nazarene. So in the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, they knew their scripture and they also knew and were aware of those scriptures that referred to Messiah as being a branch. And so in the technical way to refer to the scrolls, um, this display is showing uh, you some of those references. So they found these scrolls in a number of different caves. So they, the way they labeled uh, the scrolls is which cave they found it in and then which text within that scroll. So um, the next thing that I want to uh, share with you um, given that I've kind of like tried to save myself a little bit of time, hopefully, um, by verbalizing all this information to you because um, it becomes quite technical, uh, you know, at an initial setting, is that uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in caves um, in an area near the Dead Sea. And so the name of that area around the Dead Sea is called the Qumran. And the historians referred to the people um, that were living there as Essenes. However, that was not the only community of Essenes. That there were Essene communities that lived throughout the land of Israel. And so most commonly, at least when I was growing up, probably you've heard this um, statement as well, is that there was 400 silent years uh, from the time of the closing of the canon of the Old Testament uh, from the book of Malachi um, to Matthew, to the days of the New Testament. Um, however, um, while we don't have any canonized book of the Bible um, from Malachi uh, until um, Matthew, there was a lot going on in those years. And, and there were writings um, that were done during those years. They, it just didn't make, wasn't, um, it didn't make our, what we call our canon. And so uh, we have, among other things, uh, during that period, the, the writing of the book of Maccabees. Um, and uh, then now, a big discovery in order to understand what's going on and to connect things that was going on at that time um, is the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so, um, I stated earlier when I began my message that I believe in the sovereignty um, of the God of Israel. So another way to express sovereignty is divine providence. So do you believe in divine providence? That God is sovereign and he rules over all. And if he's sovereign and rules over all, he has a plan for this world. And this world will go and ultimately end up according to his plan. Well, if he has a plan for the world... And he made you, um, we're told in different places in the Bible, um, that God purposes what he does. So that means he has a purpose for your life. And that means ultimately has a will for your life. And therefore, if you will submit yourself to him, he will lead, guide, and direct your life. Um, because while he permits you to choose um, what you want and what you don't want, uh, nevertheless, he still is able to um, guide and direct your life in the circumstances 
of your life. And so if, if he's got sovereignty over the world, if he's able to lead, guide, and direct your life, wouldn't it make sense that the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls was also his divine providence as well? And if it is, then we have to ask the question, what, it's, what is its place and purpose for us today? And so I believe the answer is multifaceted. And one element and aspect is to be able to understand the history of the high priesthood of Israel. That was the reason for me sharing my message on Wednesday night. And only by understanding the history of the high priesthood of Israel, which ultimately that history goes through the Qumran uh, in the Essene community. And why would that be? Well, it's because we're told in the Dead Sea Scrolls that the leaders of the community were Zadok priests. Well, how do we understand the Zadok priest? Well, if we go back and read our Bible, uh, in the days of David and Solomon, um, ultimately, at the time of David's death, circumstances came about that after David's death, and beginning with the reign of Solomon, the priest in Israel, the high priest in Israel uh, that served in the temple um, from the days of Solomon is Zadok, the priest. And you know, um, the high priesthood is then going to stay uh, with the line of the Zadok priest. And the oldest son is going to then take over the job um, when the father passes on. And so uh, Josephus tells us that from the days of Solomon, um, and literally the person's name is Zadok, from Zadok the priest, that the high priesthood in Israel um, were Zadok priests until around 175 B.C. And it was in one, around 175 B.C. in the days of Antiochus Epiphanes IV that things began to change. And the Greeks tried to influence um, the practices in the temple and tried to influence the high priesthood. And so ultimately... That led to the Zadok priests being removed from being and serving in the high priesthood of Israel. So we're going to round off here, approximately, not exactly. Uh, David and Solomon uh, was about 1000 B.C. And I'm going to round off 175 B.C. to 200 B.C., so easy math. We have 800 years. We have 800 years where the high priests in Israel were the Zadok priests. However, things begin to change as prophesied in the book of Daniel. Uh, if you're familiar with the prophecies of Daniel, it says that there's going to be one ultimately that's uh, going to come and change times and seasons. Well, um, initially, this is Antiochus Epiphanes, and what he wanted to change, he wanted to change the culture. And so he wanted uh, Israel to practice Greek culture. So ultimately, um, the Zadok priests were removed from their high priesthood office. And who took their place were the Maccabees. And if you're familiar with Hanukkah and the story surrounding um, the celebration of Hanukkah, um, when Antiochus Epiphanes, when he committed the abomination of desolation in the temple, when he sacrificed the pig, when he offered up uh, and, uh, and, and was recognizing Zeus, the head god of the Greeks, instead of the god of Israel, the uh, Maccabean priests who were Levites led a rebellion. And ultimately, after three years, they were successful 
and they rededicated the temple. And so while that was a good thing, um, ultimately after they rededicated the temple, um, through making a deal um, with the Greek Seleucid king, the Hasmoneans became the high priests in Israel. And they were Levites, but they were not priests. Levites, meaning they were from the tribe of Levi, but there was one particular branch of Levi um, that started with Aaron that God said the high priests in Israel had to be descendants of Aaron. So the descendants of Aaron, they are Levites. The descendants of uh, Aaron are Levites and they're also priests. But if you're not a descendant of Aaron of the tribe of Levi, you, you're still a Levite, but you're not a priest. So the priests are only from and through the line of Aaron. And so if you go back, um, we are trying uh, to study and make uh, the learning of the Torah um, as being a part of our learning of the entire Bible. And that um, in the Torah, we have this account of what's called the Korah Rebellion. And Korah was from the tribe of Levi. And so the rebellion is that Korah, who was leading the rebellion from the tribe of Levi, um, he wanted uh, to be high priest in Israel. But God has only said, only of the line of Aaron. And Korah was not of the line of Aaron. So because someone other than the line of Aaron was seeking the priesthood, in this case, Levites, um, that was rebellion against God's will, a, a rebellion against God's decree, and, uh, and to show and to emphasize God's position, um, he asked for there to be uh, basically some sticks that represented the different tribes. And in the morning, we had the budding of Aaron's stick or Aaron's rod, and that's called the um, Aaron's rod that budded. And in order that the children of Israel would understand this lesson, God said to put Aaron's rod that budded into the Ark of the Covenant. And so it was placed there in the Holy of Holies. Well, now, if you follow the history, the, the Maccabeans, they were Levites, just like Korah was. However, they weren't of the descendancy of Aaron. So back to the Torah, they're not permitted by God to be high priest. But yet, they were priests in Israel for over 100 years. But that did not turn out well uh, because ultimately, um, after a hundred years or more had passed in trying to uh, hand things down to the next one in line, there was a civil war in Israel. And from that civil war, that is how the Romans came in. And when the Romans came in, um, they no longer permitted the Maccabees or the Hasmoneans to be the high priests. And that's when we start the reign of Herod. And from there, we understand a little bit more because we start to come into the days um, of the time of Yeshua and um, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the things that are going on there um, in the book of Acts. Um, but now, given that in the Qumran, uh, the leadership were the sons of Zadok, how and why were the leadership the sons of Zadok? Well, they were the high priests for over 800 years, 
but uh, they were removed. Um, ultimately, with the help of the Greeks. And when they were removed, they fled into the Qumran, in the Dead Sea area. And uh, they took the temple library with them. And ultimately, when the Romans came and the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in the temple, they buried their scrolls. And those are the scrolls that were found in 1947. And it was tied up in academic bureaucracy for like 50 years. And we didn't get to initially see um, more of what were in the Dead Sea Scrolls till the 1990s. And even now today, this is 2023, uh, we're still learning about them and trying to figure out what their meaning and their place and their purpose is. And so by understanding the biblical Jewish history of the high priesthood, in Ezekiel chapter 44 and verse 24, um, but also verse 15, it says the sons of Zadok, that God has stated that they are going to rule regarding matters of Torah controversy. And so once you realize the concept that biblical history is prophecy, I just was trying to recount for you some history. But biblical history is given to us to study uh, because it is also prophetic. And so there's a prophetic meaning and there's a prophetic restoration because it says in Acts chapter 3, verse 21, that there's going to be a restoration of all things. There's going to be a restoration before Yeshua comes and sets his feet down on the days, uh, sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives. So I believe we are in those end of days times of restoration. And part of those times of restoration is a call to um, examine uh, the Torah as an expression of faith in Yeshua as the Messiah. And a part of that restoration is what you're participating in today. That is to celebrate the Sabbath and then here coming in the fall uh, to keep the biblical festivals. But this is only a part of the restoration. There's going to be a restoration of the proper priesthood as well and the authority of that priesthood, the authority of the sons of Zadok. So those are, that's one of the things, uh, one of the storylines we get from the Dead Sea Scrolls, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the other one is one I um, uh, just haven't gone into uh, very deeply because I'm trying to paint for you the, the big picture of everything is uh, another line is, why was Yeshua called a Nazarene? What goes along with that is a message that I'm not going to be able to share with you, at least not this time being with you. And um, I entitled that message, The Nazarene's Influence on Early Christianity. And so it's almost universally accepted um, by the academics and scholars who study the Bible and the history of the Bible, that John the Baptist, he grew up in the Qumran. He grew up in the Essene community. So he was taught, and his belief system was the belief system of the, that Qumran community. So John was taught by the Zadok priests. Well, we're told in John chapter 1 that uh, John... The Baptist has two disciples, one of them specifically named Andrew, who became one of the 12 disciples of Yeshua. And so if John the Baptist grew up in the Qumran community, um, and his disciples would have grew up in the Qumran community, one being Andrew. So now, uh, not only have John the Baptist, who we're told in Luke chapter 1, verse 17, 
that his ministry is a ministry of the spirit of Elijah. Which the ministry of the spirit of Elijah, if we look at Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, is a ministry of restoration. So that means John had a ministry of restoration. He has a student uh, named Andrew. So one of Yeshua's disciples grew up um, in the Qumran, grew up in the Essene community, and quite possibly more than that. But here, I just shared with you in Acts chapter 24, verse 5, that Paul is being identified and he's being called a leader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Well, Paul grew up um, and, and studied under Gamaliel, who's a Pharisee. And Paul referred to himself as a Pharisee of Pharisees. So he, he initially learned uh, the viewpoint of the Pharisees. But how does he grow up learning the viewpoint of the Pharisees, studying under Gamaliel, a well-known teacher? Perhaps even he was a member of the Sanhedrin. There's an inference to that um, in the story of the stoning of Stephen. How does he go from there to being called a leader of the Essenes who were initially called Nazarenes? Somehow he went and studied their belief system. And now when you itemize the belief system of the Essenes of the Nazarenes, only then are you, are you able to connect some of the things that Paul said in his letters is things that are associated with the Essenes. And John the Baptist's ministry, um, the fact that he's calling for repentance, that he's calling for um, water um, uh, immersion, mikvah, baptism, um, this is identified with the Essenes. So... All of a sudden, only when you learn about the Dead Sea Scrolls and the history, what's going on there, and their belief system, you can make connections to our New Testament where before you're reading the New Testament from um, uh, Matthew to Revelation and probably the thought never enters your mind. And so um, uh, you end up realizing wow, there's something there, I need to investigate it and look into it a lot more deeper. So given the fact that Josephus, the main historian of the time, said that there were three main sects, the Essenes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Well, the Sadducees were linked with the temple because there were Sadducees that ended up serving in the temple and being high priests. From the high priesthood being something that was bought um, from and through the Romans. Now, the Sadducees have the name of the Zadoks. See, in English we say Zadok. Well, we can render it Sadducee. And so actually Sadducee is the English renditioning, renditioning of, of Zadok's. But they took the name of the Zadok's, but they didn't have the belief system of the Zadok's. So they were, they were corrupt. And they are as, uh, associated and identified with the temple and the temple system. Uh, but then um, we have the Pharisees. And so there is no mention of the Pharisees in what we call the Old Testament or the Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures. We do have mention of the Pharisees in the New Testament. So when and how did the Pharisees come into being? So um, if we can refer to it by this word as a sect, it was a sect that arose 
that came about at a certain point in time from the Babylonian captivity. The Jews, ultimately in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar came and took the Jews into Babylonian captivity. And so all that Israel had known um, from the days of David and Solomon is they came to the temple and the Torah was taught in and through the temple and temple life. The Torah was taught and it was responsibility of the high priests with the help of the Levites to teach the Torah to the people of Israel. But now what do you got to do when there is no temple? What do you got to do when you go to Babylon? Now your survival as a people becomes a real issue. So in order that the Jewish people wouldn't get assimilated into um, or lose their, their Jewish identity, um, what, what came to be was uh, they met locally uh, where they were at. So the name for where they met locally is called a synagogue. And then who is going to be the teachers and do the services in the synagogue? Well, it's not going to be the high priesthood because they serve in the temple in Jerusalem. And so there arose uh, those who studied and, and who would teach the people. And this is where we get the rabbis. And uh, the rabbis ultimately then, in order to affirm their legitimate place uh, to teach the Jewish people, they came up with a doctrine that the Sadducees did not have. And this doctrine is called Oral Torah. So the doctrine of the Pharisees is that they said, they made the argument that at Mount Sinai there was a written Torah and there was information that was only passed down orally. And they said that they were the inheritors of what was passed down orally, so they claim their authority to, that their authority goes back to Mount Sinai. However, um, the high priesthood, which was led by the Zadok priests, and then the Levites that helped them, the Zadok priests didn't have this doctrine of oral Torah. And so there was a conflict between them. There was a power struggle over which sect was going to be accepted and um, govern the Jewish people in exile. So what you would know of as the Sanhedrin, this is the judicial system that came about from the Pharisaic sect, wherein the uh, the Zadok priests, they had a way in which they made rulings according to the Torah, but it wasn't in and of the Sanhedrin in its system. Primarily, who served on the Sanhedrin were Pharisees and Sadducees. In very small instances, uh, did you have anyone that was an Essene serving there. Why? Because the Essenes didn't teach and believe oral Torah. Now, there was somebody who was um, a leader of the Sanhedrin along with Hillel. And his name in Hebrew is Menachem. Probably never heard of him. But actually he shows up in Acts chapter 13 verse 1. Um, and we read it in English in the King James as Manaean. And he is one of the people that lays hands on Paul and Barnabas. So he was a co-leader of the Sanhedrin with Hillel. But he left the Sanhedrin. He went to the Qumran and, and he was doing things with the Essenes. And when he left... He took 80 students with him. And so ultimately when he left identifying with the Pharisees, with the Essenes, he couldn't be on the Sanhedrin anymore. So, you know, by and large, we don't have Essenes 
on the Sanhedrin, but we do have Pharisees and we do have Sadducees. So as I mentioned earlier, the leadership in the Qumran were Zadok priests, and uh, there are specific references in the Dead Sea Scrolls that that is so. There was even a blessing for the Zadok priests in the scrolls. Now, there, the leader um, of the Zadok priests in the Qumran, um, he had a title called the Teacher of Righteousness. And this is actually in Joel chapter 2, verse 23, a title for the Messiah. Um, because if you look at it in the Hebrew, um, it says... He's going to give you the teacher of righteousness. The King James translates it as the former reign moderately. But the Hebrew says teacher of righteousness. So the teacher of righteousness is a term for um, the Messiah. And, and when, from the leadership of the Zadok priests, when they left the temple and its system, because they were removed by the Greeks, when they went to settle uh, in the area around the Dead Sea, the Qumran, they did so based upon, and they saw the inspiration to do so and direction to do so, from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Um, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 says, um, prepare in the desert a highway for our God. Um, uh, make straight in the, the desert and, and prepare the way. So because Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3 says prepare the way in the wilderness and that's the verse by which they were initially founded according to the Dead Sea Scrolls themselves they say this that they were known as the people of the way. Now you know from the book of Acts that the very early Jewish believers in Messiah, they're called the way. They're called Nazarenes, and they are called the way. So they saw that their community uh, would be until the coming of the Messiah. And with this background, you could put together who's being referred to um, in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, where it says, The word of God increased, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So who were these great company of priests that were obedient to the faith? Are they Sadducees? No. Are they Pharisees? No. Who were they? They were the Zadok priests. So uh, a large number of the Zadok priests from the Qumran became believers in Yeshua as the Messiah. So uh, what I'm going to quickly do is try to go over with you some of the beliefs that the Qumran community had regarding the Messiah. And from this, um, we're going to be able to to see how and why uh, they were able to be believers in Yeshua as Messiah. Um, but this is the process by which they saw anybody that was going to be identified with their sect. They had to confess their sins. And after confessing their sins, they were tested to see whether they were sin sincere in doing this. And once it was determined that they were sincere, then they, they could join the community. And so the community called themselves the New Covenant community. And so when they repented of their sins by joining the sect of the Essenes, um, they joined the New Covenant community. And once they were tested to validate that they were really sincere in this, um, then they committed themselves to follow the Torah, to keep the Sabbath, to keep the festivals, under the direction of the Zadok priest, and then in order to affirm um, them being a part of the covenant community, they got baptized or they got immersed. So we, we take uh, the same structure 
and it gets applied to Yeshua. You got to repent of your sins and accept Yeshua as the Messiah and his shed blood for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you join his covenant family. We call it the body of Messiah. And then um, once we do that, it's followed up by baptism, by water immersions. So they believed in, in what was called the Melchizedek Messiah. And um, the Melchizedek Messiah is associated with Isaiah chapter 61. Um, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me to, to, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of prison to those who are blind, um, etc. Uh, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the Jubilee. And so the Jubilee, going back to Leviticus 25, in the literal, is about the forgiveness of financial debt. But they applied the liberty, the, the, the forgiving of financial debt, that principle of proclaiming liberty. They saw that when the Messiah would come, he would forgive sin. So they believed in the Messiah that would forgive sin. And also... Um, they were familiar with, uh, and they believed from Daniel chapter 9, that the Messiah would die. He would be cut off. Um, and also, in joining this covenant family, they looked for the help and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to guide them. So there's different references in the Dead Sea Scrolls regarding that. So they believed in the Holy Spirit the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, the direction of the Holy Spirit. They wanted counsel of the Holy Spirit. And when you um, were a person of good character, that came about through the traits of the Holy Spirit, submitting to the Holy Spirit. And Paul called that the fruit of the Spirit. So let me quickly go through some of the beliefs that they had about the Messiah. Number one is that the Messiah would be a son of God. Well, uh, you know, uh, Luke chapter 1, 32 and 33, uh, that Messiah is the son of the most high. And so um, they also believed through um, extra biblical writings that we would call them. that They had one of them being the testament of the 12 patriarchs. This is supposed to be the, the writings of. Or, or that which came through the 12 sons of Jacob. And so there were a manuscripts of some of the testament of the 12 patriarchs at the Qumran. So among the, the testament of the 12 patriarchs said about the Messiah is, number one, the Messiah is the Lamb of God who is sinless. Number two, the Messiah would be born of a virgin. And that those who believe in the Messiah would have eternal life. That the Messiah is God who would come down to the earth. That he would save Israel in the nations. Uh, that he would be worshipped as king. And so you can see those things. And you can uh, see, and that's much of what we even identify in how we see Yeshua today. In what we call our Christian faith. So that being the case... Um, the reason why Yeshua is called a Nazarene is because the things that he did and the things that he taught, when you look at the three sects of which one are you going to label him to, um, he was labeled to the Essenes because of, of their belief system. Because, once again, they uh, believed you had to repent of your sins to join their covenant community and then get water baptized. They believed the Messiah would be a suffering servant, that he would die, that he would forgive sins, uh, that he's the Lamb of God, um, uh, that uh, he's God who came down to uh, the earth. And so with that being their foundational belief system, can you now see why and how they were able to believe that he was the Messiah? And it says in the book of Acts, that there are thousands of Jews that believe and they were all zealous for the Torah. Well, who are these thousands of Jews that believe? Were they Sadducees? Were they Pharisees? Were they Essenes? Looks like they were of the sect of the Essenes. 
And plus we have Acts 6, 7, that many of the priests that were believed were the Zadok priests. And so uh, this is how their beliefs influenced early Christianity. And we see their beliefs in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We see their beliefs in Acts. We see their beliefs in the letters of Paul and uh, Peter uh, and, and James and John and Jude. So um, hopefully from this, this will give you the background, the information you need to understand the prophecy of Matthew 2.23 that Yeshua will be called a Nazarene um, as that which was spoken by the prophets. And so if this message has been a blessing to you, please give all praise, glory, and honor to Yeshua because without him, we wouldn't be here and, and we would be nothing. So he deserves all of our praise, glory, and honor. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, he has just begun. I'm not sure when we're going to continue, but we're going to continue. Uh, thank you for being here this morning. I'd like to lead us in a word of prayer as we dismiss. Uh, there's a fellowship meal across the breezeway. If you want to stay and have lunch with us, you're welcome. There's a Torah, the, the traditional Torah study at 1 o'clock. You're welcome to stay and, and be a part of that. And we'll be keeping in touch with Eddie as he makes his way around the country. He's uh, on, a, on a special mission to go and to be with the leaders of all the congregations that believe in keeping the Torah and uh, explaining to them what he's discovered from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So quite a mission. If you want to be a part of that, you contribute to his ministry. You can do it online. You can give it to him personally here. You can give it in to the church, and we'll give it to him. But be a part of what Eddie's doing. Let's pray together. Father, we bow together and say thank you. Our minds are reeling with all the information that you've provided for us. Thank you for using the conduit of Eddie Chumney. We ask, Lord, that you bless him and that you give him health and you give him travel mercies. Thank you, Lord, that you sent him here. Give us understanding of how to take this kind of information and allow it to help us mature in our process of keeping Torah. Thank you, Father, for the worship that we've experienced, for the time that we can come and present ourselves to you as a living sacrifice. Now take us into our respected mission fields. Bless our lives. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding of how to proclaim your word. Thank you for this opportunity. We pray these things in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, our Messiah. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Eddie will be around if you want to come and ask him a question. And if you ask him a question, be prepared to stay for a few minutes, okay? <laughs> He's got the 